Hi, everyone. Can I, can I ask you guys to come closer to the front? Is that all right? So we can get all nice and cosy? Hmm? Yeah, you're good there. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yay! Okay, I definitely need some water, that's for sure. Um, how many, like, this is your first time, or was everyone here last night? Everyone was here last night, right? You weren't here last night. What's your name? Juliana. 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 Cool. Hi, Juliana. Um, okay, great. So, today's session is, well, this morning's session is going to be looking at the naked truth about sexual sin. And this is, oh, Water? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think Ben needs some water. <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually one of my favourite, favourite things to talk about. Like, I love, love talking about um, God's power and how he's actually wired sexuality and how um, when we come out of that beautiful divine plan, the repercussions that we end up encountering, but that actually God is able to deliver us from all of those things. And I speak from personal experience. You all heard my story last night, so you will know that um, I'm definitely a byproduct of Jesus's incredible saving grace. And not just me. I know, you know, I know many people that have been delivered by the Lord um, in this area. Yeah, just throw everything on the floor. I'm just going to pray super quick. Just come and park there. Mm. Yeah, it's so cool. This is very cool. Um, Lord Jesus, we just absolutely thank you. <sighs> oh, you're so good. You're so good, Lord. And I love, Lord, how um, when Delphina was singing and, you know, just the words and she was even ministering about it, that you picked up all of our pieces and you put us back together again. And just even as we talk about, you know, how we can be so broken and fragmented when we look for intimacy in all the wrong places, but you just come and you take all of our broken pieces <laughs> and then you make them into wholeness in your image and so we just thank you we thank you for your redeeming power and we thank you for your glorious love and you're so lavish with your redemption you're so lavish you're so free with it and we just thank you for your redemption in this place and I thank you Lord Jesus for every single person who's here they are not here by accident Every single person is here for a purpose, God, and I really know that you're going to encounter them. Thank you. That you are actually just going to flood them with your love and your goodness, and they'll never be the same again. So just thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Ah! definitely feel the Lord's sweetness here. <laughs> Normally what happens is when I cry and then I tap my face, um, tissue gets left on my face. So if that happens, do let me know. <laughs> Seeing as you're on camera, thanks, my love. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. <laughs> oh, funny. Um, okay, great. So as I said, this, this section is called uh, um, The Naked Truth About Sexual Sin. Um, what I love is the way that God has created um, sex within marriage is like sheer brilliance. Like the spiritual dimensions, the neurological dimensions, the emotional, the physical, the relational, all of that becoming one flesh within marriage, like 
that sheer majesty. You know, and only when I began to learn about this did I discover how brilliant God's design for sexuality actually is and how it all works together so incredibly, like it's sheer genius, the way that God has designed sexuality. And when we try and navigate through our sexuality outside of God's perfect blueprint, we can do nothing but fail. It simply cannot succeed. Like sexuality cannot flourish outside of God's brilliance. It may seem to be okay temporarily. It might hit the spot for a little while, maybe even years, but it will never actually flourish. It will always lead to destruction. But when we don't actually know what God's beautiful blueprint for our sexuality is, and if the church isn't talking about it, then we have no choice but to follow the world's way of navigating through sexuality. Because if the church isn't actually speaking to our sexual messaging, because we're sexual beings, and so when sexual messaging and sexual dialogue is taking place in the atmosphere, we're responding to it. When we're reading sexual narratives or we're seeing images, we're responding to it because we're sexual beings. But if we don't understand how to navigate through our sexuality, then we have no choice but to respond in the areas where the voices are the loudest. And at the moment, the voices about sexuality and the dictates are coming from the world. But actually, the world doesn't understand the true purpose and the true divine order of sexuality. What the world tends to do is completely take God's beautiful blueprint for sexuality and completely distort it and violate it and beautify it and actually make it look so attractive that we don't even know it's violated because we find it so appealing and so we end up accepting it because it's been beautified. Dysfunction's been beautified. Perversion has been made to look pretty. And so I've just got a couple of bits of media So, Ben, can you first um, show the donuts image, please? Oh, awesome. So, I was walking down a really posh area in London one day, and I came across, like, a dog shop. And in the window were all these big, like, donuts for dogs, like, with all, like, sugar all over them, and they all were all so pretty. And, like, as I was walking past, I was like, dogs don't eat donuts. <laughs> like, dogs don't eat donuts. Dogs were never wired to eat donuts. But they looked so pretty that if I was a dog, I would find it very, very difficult to resist these donuts because everything about these donuts was so attractive that I don't need to eat bones anymore the way that I was wired because now I've been made to believe that these donuts are what I need. And that's what's happened with sexuality. We see it with food. You know, God never wired us to eat donuts either. But we've taken God's perfect plan, perfect blueprint for food and what we should eat, like vegetation and then meat after the flood. And now we find ourselves consuming sugar and all this crap because it's been made to look so normal and so attractive that we don't even realise what God actually had for us originally for us to consume. And it's exactly the same with our sexuality. And what's actually abnormal, what was never God's plan for our sexuality, has been made so normal that it's just everyday life. And it's promoted and it's acceptable and it's something that if you're not doing this, you are deemed abnormal. So, I know it's a bit hazy, but basically he has a, he's lost a watch. And he's saying to his PA, go and find me the watch. And she is saying, okay, fine, just tell me where you left it. And he says, uh... I don't know where I left it. And then he explains to her that he probably left it with one of, well, someone that he slept with. So she says, okay, just tell me the name of the person you slept with. And he says, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, um, I don't know the names. It could be any one of these women. And then she's like, um, okay. She's asking him, obviously, to give him give more information. So all he can give her is a list of numbers and a list of names. But because he slept with so many women that week, he couldn't tell you which number matches which name. And when she gives him the look, he's like, what? What's the big deal? Like, I can sleep with whoever I want. Like, they're adults and I'm adults. What's the problem? 
And that's the kind of society that we live in where we're adults or even we're teenagers and we're not harming anyone. We're not, you know, um, doing anything wrong. And as long as we're safe, like, what's the problem? And that's the kind of narrative that the world often gives us, even at the most basic level. So for me, in my history, Ben, can I have the lights back, please? Is that all right? Thank you so much. Oh, are we on? It feels dark. Do you want to see no, it's fine. I can see. Thank you. Um, when, I, when I wasn't a believer, that was what was normal for me. It was normal for me to be promiscuous. It was normal for me to have one-night stands. It was normal for me to um, try and get guys who were with partners and actually try and get them to leave their partner so I could mess around with them. It was normal for me to flirt. It was absolutely normal for me to mess around with girls if I felt like it. It was normal for me to dress like highly provocatively because that's what I thought was normal behaviour. But in actual fact, what the world has been selling us as sex is in fact sexual disorder. God doesn't even see it as sex. What, what, what the world offers us, which is sexual dysfunction, which is same-sex attractions, homosexuality, paedophilia, you know, masturbation, all of the adultery, all of these things that God never actually designed for us to engage in, in his original design for sexuality. The world promotes them in a way where we just accept them as normal, but the world's definition of sex is not actually what God calls sex. The world's definition of sex is in fact sexual disorder. And even the church has believed the lie and has taken the world's version of sex and accepted it as being the real thing. But it's not. It's sexual disorder. And so I'm going to ask you, Ben, if you don't mind going to 1 Corinthians, the first uh, scripture reference that I gave you. 1 Corinthians, yep, one seven. So I'm just going to read, if you've got uh, the message translation, please go ahead um, and find 1 Corinthians. If not, then we can just read it up there. So it says, um, and this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, talking to the people of Corinth, where they had a lot of sexual dysfunction going on, because they'd actually come out of a worldly system, become Christians, but they were still practicing a lot of sexual immorality, uh, much like the world that we live in today. And so they're asking Paul, the Apostle Paul, is it okay to have sex? So this is what he's saying. Now, getting down to the questions you've asked in your letter to me, first, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sex life in a world of sexual disorder. So this scripture is telling us that sex, God's way, is only ever acceptable to him within marriage, but everything else is sexual disorder. And this term, sexual disorder, I'm going to unpack it a bit for you. So... Sexual disorder is anything that's outside of God's covenant marriage for sex. So that's anything that's illicit. And in the Bible, God uses the word yada, which I explained yesterday, which is knowing, to be fully known and to know someone in return. That's the word that God uses for sex, and it means to be known within the context of covenant intimacy, within that um, Full, full acceptance of one another, that unconditional love towards one another and having um, sexual relations within that framework in marriage is what God deems to be sex. But outside of that is a term called zakab or a term called bo found in the Old Testament and zakab and bo are two words that are used to describe sexual disorder, anything that isn't yada. And it means illicit sexual activity. And in the Bible, God does not even refer to sex outside of marriage. Anytime we hear the Bible talking about sexual activity that's not done in marriage and it's illicit, God does not even use the word yada. God does not even use, use the word sex. He uses the word zakab or bo. So God's definition of sex 
is only ever that which is done in covenant marriage. Everything outside of that, God sees as illicit. And in the New Testament, the word for sexual disorder is porneia. And that's where we get the word pornography from and where we get the um, word fornication from. So fornication, we often believe that fornication is having sex before marriage, but fornication is actually porneia, which is every kind of sexual illicit practice outside of yada intimacy, which is God's definition for sex. And when we actually um, begin to take that on as our normal sexual behaviour or our normal sexual wiring, what we end up doing is actually abusing our bodies. Because when we engage in anything that's not yada, we're actually abusing our bodies. And I'll show you why I come to that conclusion. So, this scripture um, is this 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 20, like the whole thing, Ben. Perfect, thank you. So we're just going to read again from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in the Message Translation, where it says, There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we become, want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. Before I carry on, I'm just going to explain. Like In the world, like before I became a Christian, I was quite happy with sex that had no intimacy. I was quite happy with just connecting with someone and walking away from them. I mean, I slept with guys I don't even know their surname. And I thought that you could have just physical sex and that was okay. But actually, God cannot even separate the spiritual away from the physical. He cannot because sex is actually a spiritual mystery. And to just use it as a physical function, it's an actual abuse of the very practice of sex, which is um, one flesh on every single level, emotionally, spiritually, physically, relationally, neurologically. And so you can't actually separate the various dimensions. What ends up happening is when we engage with sex outside of Yada, we do end up becoming one flesh and we end up engaging on every single level. But because we're not aware of it, we end up actually creating soul ties and becoming one with someone illegally. And it's not Yada, it's actually Zakab that we have ended up engaging in. And it's Pornea that we've ended up engaging in when the whole time we were just looking for love. You know, the whole time we were just looking for intimacy. But God has ordained for sexual intimacy to only ever be enjoyed within the marital covenant. And so when we try to look for it in the world's way, we end up engaging in soul ties and um, sexual dysfunction that actually ends up stealing from us the capacity to truly be intimate in future. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies, these bodies that were made for God-given and God-modelled love, for becoming one with another just going to leave it for there. Um, No, actually, let's carry on. Or didn't you realise that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. So this incredible scripture actually talks about the fact that we were created for God-modelled and God-designed love. And when we engage in zakab, when we engage in pornea, when we engage in illicit sex or illicit sexual intimacy, what we actually end up doing, we end up violating the sacredness of our own bodies. And the fact that we were created for God-modelled, God-designed love When we abuse our body through sexual sin and we give our body away or we engage in intimacy that isn't holy, what we don't realise is we are abusing this body which was created for God-modelled and God-designed love. Yes. Could you explain Zakab again? 
Yeah, so zakab is um, illicit sex, so anything that's taken place outside of yada intimacy. And there's... Um, Zakab is the Old Testament term and Porneia is the New Testament term for it. So um, Zakab is Hebrew and Porneia is Greek. Thank you for helping me point that out. And the whole thing about abuse is we often think that abuse is like sexual abuse or abuse is molestation. We never think that we could be abusing our own bodies. But I remember when I was molested as a child, I knew that that was abuse because it was done against my will. But when I then became sexually active of my own choice and I ended up being you know, sexually active with whoever I wanted, being sexually independent, what I didn't realize is there is no difference in the abuse that was done to me and the abuse that I did to myself through my sexual independence. They were both abuse. Anything outside of Yada, outside of that beautiful covenant of unconditional love, outside of that covenant of marriage, which is role modeled on the love that Christ has for his church, anything outside of that is actually abuse that we end up engaging in. And when I used to read this scripture, when I came back to the Lord and I was still wrestling and I was still kind of, you know, sometimes backsliding, sometimes engaging in sin, even though I was now a Christian. I would read this scripture and I I would feel so condemned because I would feel, and I used to read other translations, and in there it said, you know, you're sinning against your body. And it said that, you know, you're, you know, kind of like this is, your, your body is a temple of God. And I used to feel so bad. And I'd still have sex, but then I'd feel like, oh no, like I'm really like, this is God's body. And, you know, now I'm having sex and oh, I'm making myself dirty. And I felt like God was like, Bobby, you know, this is my body. You can't have sex outside of marriage because it's unrighteous and it's unholy. But the more I got to know God, God's love and I actually began to read that scripture in the way that God was talking to me and what he was saying is that Bobby I made you for love I made you for God modeled love like I gave my life for you so that you would know what love looks like and everything about you is made in love for love with love by love don't squander it you are worth so much more I found you so worthy that I died for you. That's how precious you are. That's how precious your body is. Don't just give it away. Don't engage in illicit sex. Don't touch your body like that. Don't do those things, Bobby, because you have been created for something so wonderful and praiseworthy. You've been created for the deepest kind of love. And I began to see this scripture so differently that God is not pointing a finger at us as like this old killjoy who's like, oh, stop having fun and stop having sex without marriage, you know? He's actually saying, oh my gosh, do you know what I created you for? Do you know what you're worth? Do you know what your body will do and how your body will flourish in the right environment? Why are you putting it through that crap when you are worth so much more? And when we don't know that, what we end up doing is engaging in sexual disorder and the issues with sexual disorder and having sex outside of that one flesh covenant intimacy is that you end up becoming one flesh illegally. And so what ends up happening, like I explained last night, when two become one, they cleave to one another and become one flesh. They become loyal to one another, neurologically and spiritually. They enter into a covenant marriage in the realm of the spirit, whether it's legal or illegal. And like I mentioned yesterday, I'm just going to go over those um, chemicals again because they are so important. So... When we actually become one flesh, we have sex, or we become very, very intimate emotionally, what happens is you have lots of kind of, you know, emotions running and lots of pleasure and foreplay or just the feeling of being with someone new and butterflies in your stomach and all of that stuff. And what ends up happening as a result of it is that you end up responding to the sexual cues, your senses, you know, go off the charts, your brain begins to process and you have released as a result of it lots of different chemicals, a whole multi, you know, like a um, multi-dimensional layer of lots of different chemicals that get released. 
And there are so many of them, but there's three of them that I generally talk about. And what happens is when then these chemicals actually get released, when two people are together, when those chemicals get released, if two people were alone, then when chemicals get released, the impact of the chemical impacts your brain and neuro pathways begin to get created. Um, and if you experience something or if you think something and if you keep thinking it again and again and again those mental pathways get established as a thought pattern if you keep thinking the same thing again it will take quite a while for those thought patterns to get established but if something you do is attached to an experience then those thought patterns actually get cemented much quicker if that experience is attached to a reward then you have a greater level of chemical re release because it's so exciting and there's a reward attached to it. And so what happens is your brain then stores that as an action with a reward. And it wants to do that again and again. And three crucial chemicals tend to get released. Dopamine gets released when you're engaged in sexual activity. And dopamine is Something that gets released when you're anticipating something fun that's going to happen, sometimes what you're going to eat, sometimes, you know, if you're going to have sex or you're going to jump off a mountain because you're mad, you know, or you're going to do something really like high extreme sports, like that kind of thing. So this rush kicks in and you're anticipating and anticipating and anticipating. That releases dopamine. But dopamine is only meant to be released in moderation. So when we, you know, if you're having loads of sex with someone, that's how addictions, you know, can sometimes occur. Because if you continue to have sex, the dopamine that keeps getting um, released will cause you to have a sex addi addiction because dopamine is addictive. If you're having loads of sex in your marriage, it doesn't matter because you're just getting addicted to each other and that's totally cool. But if you are having sex outside of marriage and you're having sex with lots of different people, that's how sex addiction gets created because the amount of dopamine that's being released is actually eating away at your brain but in moderation dopamine you know isn't unhealthy it's only when you have excessive amounts if you engage in masturbation or porn and your brain gets used to that release of dopamine then you actually end up over like inflating that side of your brain where the dopamine is being released in copious amounts and actually eating away at your brain. And if you are engaged in sex by yourself and you're having loads of dopamine, then the other side of your pleasure system that needs touch, it needs oxytocin, it needs feel-good hormones that you have with another person, a human being with you that God has designed to enjoy in marriage. When you don't have that, that side of your brain is completely being starved. And so if if you looked at someone's brain who was engaged in a lot of porn or a lot of masturbation and you actually looked inside their brain, you would see the same thing happening in their brain that happens when you have a cocaine addiction. Because with cocaine, it's similar. The anticipation of taking your, ne you know, like snorting your next line releases so much dopamine that the two, the brain activity that's taking place in a lot of sex, a lot of illicit sex, is the same as if you were taking a lot of cocaine. And these are the things that God actually wants to protect us from. And so dopamine is a chemical that gets released when you're having sex. If you're just having normal sex, then moderate amounts of it would be released. And then there's another chemical that gets released, which is oxytocin. And the way that God wired this whole mechanism of cleaving to one another in marriage is that not only do you cleave spiritually and relationally and physically and emotionally, but you also cleave neurologically, whereby these chemicals that get released, bonding chemicals, actually bond you to the person that you are with. And as I was mentioning earlier, if you are engaged in sex by yourself or you're watching porn, then the reactions and the rewards, all of those things are going to cause that actual practice to be stored in your brain as a memory. And it's something that you're going to keep wanting to revisit. Whereas if you are having sex with somebody, another human being, the fact that when the chemicals are like exploding, you two are actually firing and wiring your chemicals together. So the attachment that's taking place is what bonds you. And so oxytocin is the bonding chemical that women release and vasopressin is the um, bonding chemical that men release. 
It's the same chemical that both of them release when they're bonding with their newborns. And so God has actually created these chemicals to be released as part of the cleaving process that he designed for marriage. He designed for children, you know, for you to engage with your offspring. But when we then become one flesh outside of those parameters, we end up becoming loyal in a counterfeit way and we become attached in a counterfeit illicit way and what ends up happening is we end up having covenant intimacy with either a virtual image or someone who's not our spouse or is never going to be our spouse so we end up having a soul tie with someone that actually God cannot bless because it's not a covenant marriage and so what ends up happening is the demonic realm ends up blessing that union or rather sealing it and violating it and as a result of it what ends up happening is you then invite demonic repercussions on all levels of our existence into that union because it's not blessed by God it's been sealed by the demonic realm because it's Zakab and it's Bo, it's not yada it's illicit intimacy that God cannot bless is that making sense? Yeah. yeah? And um, so when we invite the demonic realm, because of things that we do... Yes, my love. Uh, can you once again uh, tell us what is uh, Zaka? Yes, yeah. So basically God um, defines sex as yada. So it's a Hebrew word which means to know and be fully known in return. And it's the word that God uses for sexual intimacy with marriage is this desire to be so transparent with another person and to have no boundaries but actually to give yourself fully and to honour and love and cherish one another with no secrets and to respect one another, not to leave one another, but to fully see one another. And that's what God has ordained for marriage. And that word yada for sex is the same word that God uses for our intimacy with him in worship and prayer. And so marital sex in God's eyes and the way that God designs it, role models the kind of intimacy that Christ has with his bride. But when we have sex outside of that marriage covenant, we actually end up engaging in something called zakab, S-A-K-A-B, which is a Hebrew word that God uses to describe any kind of sexual activity that is not in covenant marital intimacy. In the New Testament, the same definition is called porneia, because the New Testament is Greek and the Old Testament is Hebrew. And porneia is where the root word is the root word for porn, pornography, porn, um, and fornication comes from. Yeah. Cool. So when these illicit unions and connections invite the demonic realm in, we end up inviting demonic activity or demonic interference on all three levels: so emotional, physical, and spiritual. And when it comes to physical, um, you know, kind of interferences, like just for example, like abortions, you know, sexual trans sexually transmitted diseases, like all these things are byproducts of allowing illicit um, unions to take place. And, and so as a result of it, what happens is you end up having a pregnancy out of wedlock or you end up having a pregnancy in a relationship that cannot obviously allow the pregnancy to continue. And then as a result of it, you end up performing a physical abortion, you know, a termination. I, I speak from my own experience. When you end up having sexually transmitted diseases, I mean, the safest sex you can ever have is within a covenant marriage. Because within a covenant marriage, the way that God designed it is two virgins would come together who have never been touched before and then they would have marital sex. There would be no room for sexually transmitted diseases. But we live in a culture where sexually transmitted diseases are part and parcel of everyday life. Where this demonic manifestation of demonic activity that's taking place between two people, the manifestation is sexually transmitted diseases, but it's become so normal and it's so common that no one bats an eyelid that, hold on a minute, when two people have sex, disease happens. How come? 
And if two people are married, that's unlikely to happen. You know, if two people marry and follow um, a blueprint for sexuality the way that God has ordained it, then you're not even going to engage with sexually transmitted diseases. What makes me laugh is I used to be addicted to Friends. You know, did anyone ever used to watch Friends? It was a good program. But then I, I became a Christian and then... I realized, oh my gosh, it is so drenched in sexual innuendo. Like the, the themes and the narrative in that program, oh my gosh, they have ruined generation upon generation. Like the, the sexual kind of um, ideologies that are promoted in Friends, they're crazy. And for example, like Joey, like his thing, everyone knew that he would go up to a girl and just be like, how are you doing? You know, it's like everyone knew that if it moved, Joey was going to sleep with it. But what baffled me is that he never got a sexually transmitted disease. You know, like, I watched him for 10 years sleeping with anything that moves. He never once came home and said, I've caught herpes. You know, or, oh, you know, I, th I need to take some cream because I think I might have genital warts. You know, like, sorry to be graphic, but that's the reality of illicit sex. The reality is that it's ugly. The reality is that it strips you of every kind of dignity and you have shame and you have to go to a clinic to get a cream. You know, that's the reality of illicit sex. But what happens in Hollywood is that they glamorize it and beautify it. So no one even thinks that, oh, if I sleep with this person in a one night stand, or if I sleep around and I have an open relationship, it is likely that I'm going to get pregnant. Or it is likely that I may be faced with an option of having an abortion. Or I might get a sexually transmitted disease. I may get AIDS. Like, no one really puts that into the glamorized narrative of Hollywood. And I, I lived that way. I lived that way, way watching Friends for 10 years and thinking that kind of a lifestyle was normal and it was attractive and it was the way to be because no one in Hollywood told me the true reality of sexual dysfunction that the world passes off as the real deal when in actual fact that's not even what God calls sex. And then when it comes to emotional um, kind of repercussions of engaging in one flesh outside of the marriage covenant, some of the emotional issues. So when you um, become one in marital covenant and you've got all those amazing chemicals firing away in you and the chemicals are firing and wiring together and getting stored in your sexual memory, as I mentioned last night, when you then break up, those chemicals have to detach from one another. And the pain of that, I mean, has anyone ever here had a breakup? You know, like where your heart aches for that person and you can't even get them out of your head. Like you don't even want to be with them anymore. Maybe they were violent towards you. Like the relationship was so jacked up, but you are still addicted to wanting to be with them because your brain has now become so attached to them, those chemicals that your brain is so used to kind of connecting with, with when they leave or you break up, you're having withdrawal symptoms because now your brain is craving that same chemical, that same release of dopamine, that same release of oxytocin and many other feel-good um, uh, chemicals and your, your brain is actually dying without them now because it's addicted to those chemicals, it's got so used to it, your sexual memory has got so used to being attached to that person, so when you break up with them, you're actually like having to live without something that you were so dependent on. And the Lord wants to protect us from that stuff, because if you are in marriage, then you're not gonna break up, you know, and I, you know, I'm not saying that all marriages are ideal, but the hope would be that when we are following a blueprint, a godly blueprint for marriage, that we will try and stay in that marriage. But God designed it so that the neurology and the one flesh neurological dimensions that occur, he designed them to help make the marriage flourish. He never designed it so that you would break up with someone and then have to yearn for that person. But actually, that's what happens in um, emotional breakups. That's what happens in our emotional, um, like in our psyche when we actually break up. Because we're not meant to break up with someone that we've had sex with. You're only meant to have sex with the one person that you marry. And that's why God ordains for all these chemicals and all these things to happen within the framework of marriage because you're not actually then meant to walk away and engage with that with anyone else. And I don't know if, 
if, again, this is something that you experience, but when I was in relationships outside of God, lack of trust, feeling shame, lying, manipulating, it was all part and parcel of it. I never, ever trusted a guy. Never. And I very much doubt they trusted me. Like, I would always play games with them. I'd never let them know exactly how I felt. You know, for me to show them that I, you know, might have been falling for them was weakness on my part. My, my like, it was, it was never safe for me to be open. And oftentimes it would be, I would be rejected if I was too open. Or I didn't know if the guy was going to stay in the morning. Like, all of these emotional upheaval, like, you know, kind of erratic, roller coaster kind of emotions. God didn't ordain that. God ordained for us to fall in love in honour and in respect and in love. And even when we date as Christians, you know, that love and God's um, kindness and his image bearing kind of affection towards one another would sustain us in dating. So we're not um, deceiving one another. We're not, you know, um, playing games with one another. We're not... um, abusing or manipulating one another and that's how God designed it so that relationships where we become close and we become one emotionally there's a sense of well-being and there's a sense of trust but when we engage in like sexual relationships outside of God there's a complete lack of trust like there's always like this um, place of maybe guarding your heart you can't fully love one another unconditionally because outside of God none of us know how to love properly None of us, you know, when people go to the altar and people say, till death do us part, no one goes to the altar thinking, well, actually, I don't think I'm going to hang around for this. Like, everyone goes to the altar saying, I want this to work. Like, majority, 99% of people walk down the aisle, whether they know God or not, to want that marriage to work. But outside of God, none of us have the capacity, even as Christians, outside of God, none of us have the capacity to love another human being unconditionally outside of God's agape love. And when we operate in relationships outside of agape love, we end up lusting, we end up taking, we end up hurting because we don't know how to do it any other way. And so when we engage in one flesh outside of God and we open the door to the demonic emotionally, that will really damage us. And also when, um, you know, like I said last night, for a woman, her, the area in her brain where she stores her sexual memory is bigger than the area in the man's brain. And so oftentimes it would be like the woman doesn't get over the breakup as quickly as the man does. And this is why you could have a breakup with someone and not even want to be with them anymore. You could be with another person. You could be married. You could now be living a new life. But actually, you cannot stop thinking about your ex. They may have been abusive to you and you can't stop thinking about them. It's because you have an attachment and you are one in the realm of the spirit and you are husband and wife in the realm of the spirit, one flesh. Even though it's illicit, even if you break up in the natural, that is still there until you break off that soul tie. And I've, I've encountered that where, you know, the thing with these chemicals are they are no respecter of scenario. So they don't care if two people come together in holy matrimony or if they come together in illicit one-night stand. They're still going to attach. They're still going to bond. They're still going to fire and wire together and they're still going to get lodged in your sexual memory. And this is why you could have sex with someone just once and not be able to forget about them for, for the longest time, even though they were casual to you. Like I had encounters with people that we, we probably only stepped with each other once and I could not get them out of my head for 18 months. Whereas there would be someone else that I may have known a much longer time and it was much easier for me to forget about them because the actual attachment that takes place in our neurology, unless we break it off, it keeps us attached to that person. And I know someone very, very close to me. They are in a really dysfunctional relationship. They've been in a dysfunctional relationship for more than a decade. There's so much brokenness. There's adultery. There's so much pain. Yet they keep coming back to each other because they don't understand that unless they actually get married before God, their union is illicit. And they don't understand that unless they break off the soul ties, they will continuously keep coming back to each other because in their neurology, they are one flesh. And in the realm of the spirit, they are still one flesh. 
And what I said about women, you know, that their sexual memory is so big, the area that stores it, so they end up keeping things in their memory for ages and it takes them longer to get over a breakup. Now, when you think of a man, you might think, oh, a man gets, gets, um, gets away with it. Like, they don't really have that many repercussions from an emotional, you know, emotional repercussions from um, a breakup. But what happens with men is, and probably with women as well, but they end up losing their capacity to be loyal. This is why men don't commit. Because what happens is, even if once, outside of a marital covenant, you become sexually active, you then end up bonding with either an illicit um, image, like a, a virtual image in porn, or you end up bonding with um, someone else outside of marriage, or you commit adultery or whatever, what ends up happening is you end up diluting and violating your capacity to actually bond to your spouse in future. Because God has created us to bond to our spouse in a lifelong relationship. And so when we end up bonding to someone in an illicit way, what happens with men, they will end up actually jeopardizing their capacity to bond to anyone. And if you have a man who does sleep around, every single time he sleeps around with someone, he dilutes his God-wired capacity to actually operate in the vasopressin and actually bond and be loyal to his spouse. And each time his capacity to be loyal weakens and weakens and weakens before he's unable to actually stay committed to his spouse or his future spouse or even his children you know so men don't get away with it either yeah because it, it has the same effect in that you um, have counterfeit attachments so you end up becoming loyal to that virtual image and so you end up violating your loyalty mechanisms <coughs> you end up violating that wiring inside of you, amongst a lot of other things. Um, and now what I want to actually talk about um, is spiritual dimensions. Like what happens is when we become one flesh with someone outside of a marriage covenant, and like I've said, we have spiritual repercussions, we have emotional repercussions, and now I want to talk about um, sorry, I said physical repercussions, emotional repercussions, and now I want to address some of the spiritual repercussions that end up taking place. Now, remember what I said, that when you cleave and you become one flesh in marriage, God comes and seals that union. But when we become one flesh outside of marriage, then seducing spirits and the demonic realm will come and seal that union. And what can end up happening... What can end up happening? So when two people come together, you will find in marriage that they begin to kind of act like each other a little bit, you know? Yeah. They might finish off each other's sentences. They might kind of, um, you know, if one bears really good fruit in an area, then you know it's going to rub off on your spouse. Like, that's the way that it goes. It's, a, it's transference of the Holy Spirit. Like how someone, you know, is really operating in an anointing and then you become one with someone in marriage, then you're going to find that actually that brushes off on the person that you're with because iron sharpens iron. And what happens in um, illicit one flesh encounters is that you end up having a transference of spirits, but what ends up happening is the spirits, the demonic junk that one of them is carrying will just be shared with the person that they're sleeping with. And so you have this transference of spirits where you end up taking on some of the demonic oppression or some of the demons that the person you're sleeping with is actually operating in. Ask me in a minute, yeah? So I'll give you an example. I remember um, there was a time when I was coming to the end of a five-year relationship and I already knew that I was bored with this guy that I was actually um, engaged to be married to and I'd already decided in my mind that we're not going to be together in, anymore. I'm bored and I'm now looking for more kind of excitement. And I remember working in this company in Mayfair and with all the guys in the office, I would go to strip clubs and take cocaine and stuff and I was just hunting for excitement. And I was actually already seeing a guy in my office. But one day I was with a different guy 
and we were just in the pub and we were just having a drink. And this other guy who was just a friend and um, we were talking and he was telling me how whenever he goes out, he's in a long-term relationship with his girlfriend, he said, whenever I go out, I always end up making out with strangers. And I remember looking at him and thinking, you idiot. I, who was I to say he was an idiot considering the crap that I was involved in? But at that time, I, I wasn't doing that. At that time, I would have thought, like, uh, for me, at the time, I could, I could two-time guys and, you know, I could kind of do all this other stuff. But this idea of going to a club and just kissing lots of different people in one night, even though you were happy with the person that you were with at home, I couldn't get my head around that. Because I only ever really two-time someone that I just was bored with. If I was happy with someone, I wasn't gonna two-time them. So when he shared that with me, I was just like, wow, that's a bit crazy, weird. But anyway, not too long after that, me and this actual guy, we ended up going out with each other. And as, and we ended up sleeping with each other. And I remember after I slept with this guy, maybe two or three times, after that, every time I would go to a club, I would make out with random strangers. And it was like the crap that he was carrying got transferred to me. Before that, I didn't even, I didn't even feel the need to ever do that. And so I ended up behaving spiritually the way that he was behaving. And this is also like, demons they look out for each other you know demons complement each other and so if you've got someone who um is very very timid maybe someone may have even been abused when they were young but they have a spirit of abuse on them or they have a place of like where they're wounded and if that does not get dealt with then you will have a, a demonic spirit that's territorial, a demonic spirit that's forceful, a demonic spirit that will come and violate someone who's timid. And so you can have someone who's quite frail or timid who always seems to attract a person who's dominating. Because that spirit operating on a dominating person will look for timid spirits that are operating in someone. And so you find yourself always attracting the same kind of person. Like you can have someone that says, I don't know why, but I always end up with the bad boys. You know, I'm not looking for them, but I always end up with them because spirits attract one another. And I found that with me. I found that I would always end up finding, like I remember without giving, you know, but this is what happened. Like I remember actually being on a flight to India to go and see my mum and I ended up meeting someone in the transit like when we landed in Saudi Arabia or wherever it was and I was there for a few hours and I ended up fight, like meeting someone and we both ended up making out in a transit and we were both going on the same flight. Like how could I, in an airport of thousands of people, how could both of us have found each other and ended up in the right place at the right time and ended up making out? Like it's ridiculous, but spirits attract one another. And so these are some of the things that we engage in when we do um, enter into one flesh or sexual dysfunction, basically, yes. So is that, uh because I have a friend, I was still uh, new as a Christian. Yep. And we both served the Lord together. We were very young, like 23, 24 years old. And uh, she, you know, he confides to me that he he rides a public transport. Mm -hmm. Because in the Philippines, you have to ride a public transport. Sure. And he just met a man. Yep. Just look at the eyes. Mm -hmm. And then they, they end up in a... Totally. Yeah. So it's like, wow, how, yeah. did, how did it happen now? I came to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like, I remember watching something on YouTube about, um, like, you know, the realm of the spirit and how we function. And in the realm of the spirit, like, if, if right now we were all walking down the street and we could see what's happening in the realm of the spirit, you would see people that don't know the Lord, they will have like this heavy kind of like dark cloud around them. And we, as believers, would have this shining light around us. You know, if, if someone pulled back this layer of reality here, you would see that you can distinctly recognise who we are. And so spirits can simply, they just recognise each other. And if you are under oppression and you are led by that spirit, like I know, like there were times when 
I had so much lust operating in my life, like so much lust, no word of a lie, I could smell lust. Like sometimes, and, it, and I, it was crazy, like sometimes I would wake up and I would just smell lust. Maybe distinctly in three occasions in my life as a heathen, I could smell lust. And that was a spirit of lust that was operating in my life. And I gave myself to that spirit in the sense that I was being driven by the world's ways. You know, like the, the prince of the air, he was dictating how I lived my life. I was putty in his hands. And so the spirits that were operating in me, because of all the junk I was carrying, they were dictating how I was behaving. And so all you need is two spirits to recognize one another and the people that they have been given permission to not possess necessarily, but to make a habitat in, they are simply able to recognize one another. You know, so that's not uncommon at all. Um, babes, you had a question. Okay, perfect. Great, awesome, awesome. So, um, on the same vein, of demonic, uh, like spiritual repercussions. So what we do is when we engage in illicit sex, we simply open the door to the demonic. We see it with sexually transmitted diseases. We see it with emotional dysfunction. We see it with, um, you know, spiritual dysfunction, where you begin to, um, you know, where there's demonic activity happening. And the the more you engage in that, the more it, the power and the hold of it increases. And the reason being is because lust always increases. And so I don't know if everyone remembers, but yesterday I gave you the definition of lust. Lust is fulfilling a legal need illegally. So our need for sex is a legal need. Our need for companionship, our need to... Um, enjoy sexuality and enjoy intimacy, that's a legal need. But when we try and fulfill that need outside of marriage, we are engaging in lust because we are trying to fulfill a legal need in an illegal way. And that's what creates lust. And this world system is operating illegally because it's operating outside of God it's a world system that's built outside of God, so it's built entirely on lust, on what you see with your eyes, what you want with your flesh, and the pride of life. So this world operates in this very spirit of lust. And when we try and fulfill our desire illegally, lust is birthed, and by nature, lust increases. And so it opens the door to the demonic. And it may not even have started as an issue of sexual lust. Because what happens is lust increases or demonic activity increases in your life because you may have engaged in, you might be bitter, you might be carnal, you might be wrestling with unforgiveness, you may have been abused, you may have abused someone, many things could have happened in your life which then build strongholds in your life, which then can open the door to the demonic, which then you could have an issue of unforgiveness or an issue of bitterness, but because you've got so much demonic activity now happening in your life and because de demons attract one another, you can then end up opening the door to a sexual demon even though your issue in the beginning may not have even been sexual. It may have been carnality, it may have been anger, it may have been fear, it may have been bitterness. But what ends up happening is you end up creating, allowing strongholds to be created in your mind, which then open the door to the demonic because the way strongholds operate is you end up giving Satan legal right to erect a place of safety inside your soul. And from, so a stronghold occurs when you allow, when the enemy has legal right to erect a place of safety inside your soul where he can attack you legally in your soul. And he finds a place, because a stronghold is um, a warring term. It's like a fighting term. And so when we engage in sin or we open the door to the demonic or um, the demonic 
uh, influence in our life gets greater and greater we begin to attract lots of different demonic influences and strongholds get built in our life then what happens is the, the enemy can actually war against us in a place of safety inside of our very soul and w- this is why we can't do anything we have to break those strongholds down because he actually has a legal right to do that and that can then open the door to great demonic interference that's how I believe sex demons begin began to come and attack me because, or visit me, because I had sins and sexual, or not sexual, but I had strongholds in my soul that gave the enemy legal right to begin to build a place of safety inside my very soul. Yes, babe. And when you say build a place of safety, you mean the enemy is building his own little safe place. It's like in our soul, um, it's a place where the enemy can assault our thinking, our because the the soul obviously is our mind, will, and emotions. And strongholds ultimately are either godly strongholds are godly thought patterns, and demonic strongholds are demonic thought patterns. And so when we engage in a mindset or we engage in a thought pattern that isn't godly and we keep engaging in it and we keep engaging in it and we keep engaging in it, then we align with a demonic mindset and we actually give the enemy the right to come and build that in our mind, will and emotions because now we've partnered with the demonic realm by believing that lie and constantly thinking that way. And so now we can't even stop thinking those negative thoughts anymore because what was just jacked up thinking becomes a stronghold where the enemy, because we've partnered with that lie, actually comes to a place of safety in our thinking, in our thinking patterns, and he can't be stopped unless that stronghold is broken through the word of God. Yeah? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give you um, an example of the strongholds that were built in my mind, which then led to the sex demons um, that I spoke about last night. It was very interesting. Um, Okay, so basically, like I explained, um, I was brought up in a Hindu kind of environment, so there was a lot of demonic activity just from idol worship. So already the environment that I was living in was a demonic environment because demons, idols, were being worshipped in my home for a start. And so anything that those demons, um, any attributes attached or associated with those different false idols would have been operating in the environment that I was growing up in. And when I was, like I explained, I was molested maybe two or three times or four times when, that I remember as a child. And um, I remember like the third time it happened, the third time was a cousin. And the third time that it happened to me, um, I actually enjoyed it. I knew it was wrong, but it awoken, it awoke these like desires in me. And I was only 11 at the time, woke these desires in me where I now had been awoken in my sexuality in an illicit way. And I was also around that time, um, maybe, maybe a few years later, I started reading adult books And so these seeds of illicit sexual behaviour had been sown in me within an environment of already having like demonic activity in my home because my family would worship demons. And so when I was then molested, these seeds of illicit sex have been um, sown into my soul. And then I begin to read these um, adult themed books. And the whole time I'm not allowed to have boyfriends. I've got no interaction with boys in the sense that I'm not allowed to have boyfriends. So what is exotic becomes erotic. So what I'm not allowed to do, the taboo becomes more kind of... um, attractive to me but I'm not allowed to do any of those things and then when I was um, 13 I remember one day as I explained yesterday having a dream where I was making out with a friend of my sister's a boy and I had an orgasm and at that time I wouldn't have even I just remember feeling I remember feeling so good I remember I kissed this 
boy in this dream and I had an orgasm and it felt so, so, so good, but I had no idea what it was. And I'm just going to be so real with you guys because honestly, like, I feel that if I'm not honest with you, you're not going to be honest with God. So I'm just going to be super honest with this journey because transparency begets transparency. And um, so I remember having this thing in a dream and I remember not too long after that, I began to touch myself. And I, I think the first ever time I touched myself, I had an orgasm and all of a sudden, all I just thought was, is what happened to me in that dream. And it was that thing that where I'd enjoyed it so much, like it was such a feeling of pleasure. So when I touched myself and I had the orgasm, I had found this thing where, oh my gosh, I can feel that kind of pleasure. And so I continued to do that throughout my teenage years. And when I then became sexually active when I was 16 and started having sex, I probably didn't masturbate during those times. Um, but I remember when I then as I got older and as I started taking drugs and as I, you know, got involved in like illicit kind of relationships and stuff, then my propensity to masturbate got stronger. And even when I was with a guy, I would still, like even though we would be having sex or doing things sexually, I always knew the way that I liked to be turned on because I was so used to now the way that I knew um, I preferred to have an orgasm. So even though I was in a relationship now, I was still depending on masturbation to actually make me feel good about myself. And when I actually then became a believer, I, because I said yesterday that I actually found Christianity so boring, and by this time I'd had lots of one night stands, by this time I'd taken so many drugs, and I'd messed around with girls, like I'd done so many things, and then when I became a Christian, and I knew that actually I can't do any of these things anymore, like I need to be really, really good, but because I found Christianity so boring, and because I was still masturbating, I didn't know how to stop, and so what would end up happening is I would still do that as a Christian, and then I would backslide, and then I would still have sex with guys, and I went back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and I got baptised, and I went to Bible school, and all this was happening as I was a Christian. And so when I had that demonic attack and that sex demon had sex with me that night when I was wide awake, I knew that it was the repercussions of all of the sexual sin that didn't even start off as my own sin. Like me being molested, that wasn't even my own sin. That was someone else's sin that had built a stronghold in my soul and that stronghold opened the door to lust and I continued to go down this road of lust for the next 20 years. But that didn't even begin because of my sin. That began because of abuse that was done to me. So strongholds aren't, aren't erected just because you've sinned. Strongholds get erected because of sin, full stop. And so those strongholds give the enemy a doorway to come and assault you. And so when I finally surrendered to Jesus after that demonic attack, and I discovered that actually what had attacked me was an incubus spirit, and what an incubus and a succubus spirit are, like a, they're, they're sex demons that will come and have sex with you. And to be quite honest, they have been operating for centuries and thousands and thousands of years. And this is why I believe that we wrestle with so much sexual dysfunction in our generations, because you have people that are being visited in their sleep, and they don't even know that sex demons are having sex with them. And some, some definitions, when it comes to these sex demons, they call them incubus, which is an incubus is a male demon that has sex with a female. And then you have a succubus spirit, which is a female spirit that has sex with males. But some say that it's the same demon. Some say that the very demon itself is bisexual. 
So it operates in both. And with the increase of just those demonic visitations that people must be having the way I was having them, that must be having generation upon generation, like maybe that's why we have so many people that are bisexual now. Maybe that's why we have so many people that are wrestling and grappling with their sexuality because they don't even know that sex demons are visiting in their sleep and actually changing their psyche, changing the way that they see sex, abusing them, raping them, violating them, sowing sex seeds of sexual dysfunction, opening the doors to lust in their lives. I mean, look how sexually dysfunctional our whole world is. And much of it is because of demonic activity and doors that have been open generations before. You know, in generation upon generation, you could have visitations for sex from sex demons and you don't even know it, but they are influencing the way that you actually live your life, the way that you walk your sexual journey and the choices that you make and the orientation that you choose and the way that you see yourself and the way that you see your gender. All of that stuff is being impacted by things that are happening when you are closing your eyes and going to bed at night. Because it was only when I had that demonic attack while I was awake that by God's grace I began to put all of that together and I realized that oh my gosh this started happening to me when I was 13 and when I look back and I connected all the pieces and I thought, realized that I've had an incubus spirit having sex with me for 15 years and people don't even realize and people become so accustomed to it like I I when I was a heathen, I just knew that I sometimes had orgasms in my sleep. I, did, well, I was indifferent to it. But there are people who actually engage with that spirit. Because these spirits, they're territorial. They will actually see you as their wife or they will see you as their husband. In the realm of the spirit, you are actually their spouse. And you've got a counterfeit attachment to them. And so what will happen, this is some of the reasons that people are not even getting married, because in the realm of the spirit, they are actually one with a demon. And I remember watching a program recently. <clears throat> I remember watching a program recently, like Good Morning Britain, um, and there was this woman on it, and it, she was sharing how she, her, her lover is a ghost. And exactly what I'm telling you now, except she doesn't know that it's not a ghost, it's actually a sex demon. And she was saying that that's her husband and that she wears different night dresses for this demon and that she knows how he wants her to touch him or, you know, all of this stuff because she's actually created a jacked up, like demonic relationship with this sex demon that visits her. And because these demons are territorial, when you then begin to engage with that, you end up literally having a marriage covenant with a demon. And these things have to be broken off. And that's what had to happen with me, that when I realized that what had been happening to me for the last 15 years, and the Lord showed me, and then I completely surrendered my life to the Lord, and I broke off every single soul tie that I had with any guy, that I had with anything that had ever visited me, I was able to break all of those things off. And like I explained to you guys last night, that... Um, when I was actually having that demonic encounter and the Lord said to me that that was the spirit of the world that was raping me. The spirit of the world. This spirit of the world that I had actually got so accustomed to living for. Dictating, as a believer, I was allowing the spirit of the world to be my friend. And so when I was being molested by that demon that night, the Lord said, that's the spirit of the world that's raping you. The spirit that you've been friends with, the spirit that you've actually made attachments to, the spirit that you allow to dictate your life and the, and the one who's behind the spirit of the world is Satan. And so when I then gave my life to the Lord fully after that attack and I cut off all soul ties, God showed me that any time I engage with the spirit of the world again, I open the door to the demonic and that's the thing, carnality is what will take us straight into the demonic. Addictions to TV, addictions to the worldly system, anything that is outside of God, ways that the world operates in when it rejects God and just self-sufficiency and living for the temporal, all that carnal lifestyle will open the door to the demonic because we are not of this world. 
We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And when we follow lust and when we allow ourselves to be driven by lust, which is the very operating like um, commodity of this world, we end up allowing the enemy legal right to come into our lives and to build strongholds because we have actually aligned ourselves with a worldly system. So this is everything that the Lord actually wants to protect us from. There's something I want to talk about now before I'm going to give us a five-minute break because this stuff's intense, right? Like, ah. Um, you might think, okay, all of that stuff hasn't happened to me, praise God. You know, you might be like, yeah, okay, that sounds out there, but that hasn't really affected me. But there is a scripture, um, which is already up there, thanks, Ben, in 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18, where, where it says, there is a sin in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. And this is the thing. When it comes to sexual sin, we actually sin against our own bodies, like I said earlier on with the abuse. And I, re I watched um, a teaching by Bill Johnson where he talks about this very thing. He says that when we actually become one outside of a marital covenant, we actually get so fragmented because we begin to give parts of ourselves away. So when we become one illegally, we become fractured because what was to, meant to become whole and one flesh in marriage is actually being given away illicitly. And so we become fractured and our identity actually begins to get shattered. Who we are, our divine disposition as image bearers of Christ, where, we've, where we're called to be a certain way and we're called to multiply and, you know, fill the earth and govern and bless this world. Like all of that gets totally shattered because in our core, we are fragmented. We don't know who we are. We're not sure about our sexuality. We're not sure about our gender. We don't know, you know, who it is that God created us to be because we've become fractured. And that's what happens with sexual sin or that's what happens when our gender is actually confused. At our core, we become shattered. And that's one of the repercussions of actually engaging in something like sexual sin or engaging in issues that will try and rob you of your identity as a male or a female. And this is what Satan wants to do. Satan wants our very image or our image-bearing identity as masculine or female made in the image of God. He wants that to be completely stolen because if we don't know who we are as image bearers of Christ, then we will never be able to be fruitful, we will never be able to multiply, we will never take dominion over the earth. And so actually, sexual sin ends up being not just a sin against us as an individual, but against the very mandate that he gave the body of Christ and the mandate that he gave humankind. So even though you may not encounter all the demonic stuff, but the enemy is st stealing and killing and destroying at our core level so that the bride of Christ never rises up. Okay, um, right. So I want to go back to the shattered identities issue because I want to talk now about the different areas of um, sexual disorder that our world deems normal so I'm just going to ask for everyone just to make sure they're seated if they're staying okay so I am going to look at three different areas now I'm going to look at homosexuality I'm going to look at um, pornography and masturbation and I'm also going to address um, the transgender issue but that isn't necessarily from a sexual perspective it's more from a gender perspective but I want to focus on this shattered identity thing because the thing with shattered identities is that if at your very core your identity is fragmented then you are unable to truly thrive and when God says that the only way I have ordained for you to function is as a male or a female, 
and that the only way I've ordained for you to be intimate sexually is as heterosexual within a marriage covenant, the reason he says that is because outside of his blueprint and outside of those dynamics, you cannot actually thrive. Our society, this world, existence cannot thrive outside of that framework of being male and female, made in the image of God, being fruitful, multiplying and taking dominion and being intimate only within marriage outside of that, you simply cannot blossom and thrive. And so first I want to talk about this gender issue. And the thing is, um, I mean, I'm not that, you know, uh, equipped in this area, but I understand how important it is. And I understand that the transgender issue or the gender issue is so heartbreaking and it's filled with confusion and it's filled with so much turmoil because you have so many people that are confused and feel like they are not actually the gender that they wanted to be or they feel connected with, that the gender they got assigned with at birth isn't actually the gender that they feel comfortable being. And so when I'm talking about gender confusion or I'm talking about the transgender issue, I am not negating or diluting in any way the pain and the heartbreak of anyone going through gender dysphoria or parents that are wrestling with children that are having confusion about their gender and experiencing heartbreak and experiencing pain and experiencing bullying. Like I am not um, in any way wanting to water that down or dismissing it. But what I will say that anything outside of God's blueprint simply cannot flourish. And so when it comes to the ideology of transgenderism, it cannot actually flourish. There's one thing which is gender dysphoria, and that's when someone feels that they actually, they're wrestling with confusion, they feel uncomfortable or they feel out of sync with the gender that they were born in. So there's so much pain in that. And someone may not even ever do anything about that. It might just be something that they live with, that th that discomfort of maybe being born in a male's body, but actually they feel that they, were f they are female or they feel confused in that male, you know, framework. And like I said, they may never act on anything there. But then when it comes to transgender, the actual ideology of transgender, what that promotes is that you can change your sex. That you can, you can become a trans woman or trans man or trans boy or trans girl and that you are not just a trans girl, but you are a girl. That's the transgender ideology that says that you can actually become the other sex by carrying out surgery or taking um, medicine or having puberty blockers and that you can become the other sex by having those external functions carried out. But we know that the Bible says that in the image of God we were made male and we were made female. We know that you cannot actually change your gender. You cannot change your sex. The chromosomes cannot actually change. And as much as you can have confusion, as much as you can have brokenness, and as much as you may even take the step of getting modern medicine and taking puberty blockers and, you know, having people use the pronouns that you want them to use and as much as we can you know have toilets or have different areas and you know as much as we can make it a law that you, if that person is a trans woman or a trans girl they need to be called girls we can do all of that stuff on the surface but at the very core you cannot lie and you cannot change the fact that God created you to be male or God created you to be female it's actually impossible to do that and God is not a man that he should lie when he said in the word that we are created male and female in his image, he meant it. And who we are in our gender is acutely, infinitely wrapped up in our, his purpose for our lives. 
And so when we fully embrace our gender and our biological sex, we are able to then be fruitful and multiply, not just sexually, not just, you know, reproductively, but creatively and relationally and emotionally. And we are able to govern. We are able to bless this nation. We are able to bless this generation, bless this earth when we have an actual understanding of who it is that God created us to be, male or female. And so no matter what anyone might try and say about gender, it cannot be changed because it is God ordained. Now it's quite different if you are an intersex individual and you were born with a biological defect, which means that you have genitalia that's, you know, you may be a male and have a vagina or you may be a female and also have a penis. So you can have um, a, a medical defect that you are actually born with that means that, you know, there's ambiguity with your genitalia. But that is actually a place where anyone who has that as an issue, and it's less than 2% of the population, so it's not that common, but anyone who actually ends up having that, like, they need grace. They need mercy. That's something that they were born with. The amount of confusion amount of heartache and brokenness and actually like the amount of just turmoil that what they will go through life like there has to be grace for that person because they are dealing with a defect that they had no choice over they were born that way and there are eunuchs in the bible like this is not a new phenomenon there they are eunuchs in the bible that god actually gave prominent positions to and there's a scripture which i'm going to have to grab i don't have it at hand someone told me this that there is a scripture where in the whole bible there's this one place that god extends mercy to unprecedented mercy to and it's to the eunuchs so God has grace and mercy and comfort for anyone that has to deal with this broken, you know, fragility of having a defect since birth that means that you do have this intersex condition. But that's quite different to the transgender ideology that says you can choose. You cannot choose. Gender is not a choice. Yes, please. Clarify that intersex means your chromosomes say one thing, but your actual body says another, like your, your physical attributes. Yeah, so normally what happens is your chromosomes say one thing, but you have um, genitalia that might contradict that. And so what you actually end up going through is the confusion of actually maybe feeling like a woman but also having male genitalia. So you are, you are oftentimes having to deal with the physical defects that you have to come to terms with and which then may also lead to confusion about your gender and the way you're meant to feel because of the physical you know, manifestations. And actually, with um, sometimes when it comes to intersex individuals, you don't even realise that, even though you're born with it, but you don't even realise that until puberty kicks in you know, sometimes. So sometimes you could see it at birth, but sometimes it's something that you don't even pick up until actually maybe, you know, um, it's time for puberty and maybe your breasts aren't growing or they are growing and they're not meant to grow, you know, so you don't necessarily always discover that someone's intersex until later on in life. So if you've got someone who was okay in their um, gender and then they discover they're intersex, then that's a whole new place of like wrestling and like identity kind of crisis that they will have to go through. But as heartbreaking as it is, we must make the distinction between something that you're born with that you have no choice over and you have to wrestle with and there is grace and mercy for that and something that you are actually trying to change biology to suit. A choice that you are choosing to make for yourself that isn't negating the confusion, that isn't negating or taking away the pain and the turmoil, but it is actually turning around and saying, because I feel like a woman, I am a woman. And, you know, without, like, trying to be funny, but when I was 16, I wanted to be black, you know? Like, I honestly, I did. I used to listen to R&B music, I used to date black guys, and I used to talk like I was black, and, you know, I danced like I was black, and I just wanted to be black. 
But imagine if I'd gone to a surgeon and said, dye my skin black. Imagine if I said, actually, change me because I want to be black. But I, I, you know, this might seem like a stupid example, but imagine if I convinced myself and I, and I, and there were many reasons I wanted to be black, you know, I'm not negating those reasons and I'm not negating how I felt if I thought I could fit in with, you know, this other culture. But the bottom line was, I'm not black, I'm Indian. <laughs> Sorry, my parents are Indian. And as much as at that time I would have wished that they were from the West Indies or, you know, Jamaica or Nigeria, like they were from India. And imagine if I had done that and fast forward all these years, would I be living my purpose? Would I be thriving? Would I be flourishing? Or would I be doing something that was completely not what God created for me because I gave in to those places of insecurity and those places of pain and those places of confusion? And the issue is right now, we have whole ideologies that are being pushed on us because of something that isn't from God. And I really do want to make that distinction that you can have intersex conditions where there is grace and mercy. And there is grace and mercy available for anyone who's dealing with gender confusion as well. There's always grace and mercy. But we cannot say that just because someone chooses to be another sex, that that is the way that God made them. But that the way that they will thrive is to be who God has created them to be. And there is grace and mercy for there to be restoration. And there are so many stories and accounts of people that have actually had surgery to change their gender and they are just as broken, if not more. I mean, the rate of suicide that increases in people that have actually had the gender surgery, that the rate goes through the roof it would once be redundant you... anyway, it would be phased out anyway, because through homosexual sex, you cannot actually have children. And so if we even took wow. everything out, if we took the sin aspect of it all out of homosexuality, it cannot actually thrive. Homosexuality cannot complete the plans and purposes of God if you even ignored everything else. It's simply not feasible. And many people do believe that there's a gay gene. But actually scientists have, many scientists, the majority of scientists will tell you that there is not a gay gene. There may be a gene that we all have, and it's a gene that's less than 10% impact on the way that we actually will end up being. It's less than a 10% influence, and it's not even a gay gene. It's a gene that has a behavioral trait that could lead you towards the propensity of any kind of behavioral dysfunction. So it's a gene that could maybe sway you towards anger, sway you towards um, sex addiction, sway you towards promiscuity, sway you to, towards homosexuality. So it's a gene, not that's a gay gene, but a gene that could sway you towards the propensity of a certain behavioural trait that you might have in your family. But actually, what they say is homosexuality is not um, nature, it's nurture. So it's derived or it's, it's created or it's fostered not from a gene in you know, your generation before, but the environment that you grow up in. And so 90% of what usually impacts a homosexual to have a homosexual relationship is not because of anything that they had at birth, but it's the environment that they grew up in. And ultimately, with all the media that's telling you that now, you know, gay marriage is okay, with it being a law, with it being normal, it's more likely that that environmental influence will cause someone to be gay because it's everywhere that you go, which is why I believe part of the reason where you know, gay marriages are increasing because it's part of the environment that we now live in. And also, um, people like psychologists actually say that heterosexuality itself is not genetic either. They say that heterosexuality is actually something that you have to nurture. And so if heterosexuality is something that you have to nurture, how less the possibility that you know homosexuality could be genetic if heterosexuality itself isn't deemed genetic. 
you know. Good point. Um, let me just turn around here. So when it comes to homosexuality, um, yes, homosexuality often, to be quite honest, the way that homosexuality, from what I've studied, the way that homosexuality comes into a person's life, like I said, it's the environment. And actually what happens is, which we'll go through in the next session, is that we have different stages of sexual development in our lives. And that might be when we first are born, when we're growing up as like toddlers, when we're interacting with our parents, interacting with our peers, going to school, hitting puberty, um, having relationships, adolescence, all of that stuff. You have so many different crucial stages to cultivate a healthy understanding of sexuality. And oftentimes homosexuality or gender confusion kicks in when those normal stages of sexual development are violated or are interrupted. That's often how homosexuality tends to maybe come or enter into someone's life through interruption or through abuse or through not having a good relationship with the males in your family or the females in your family or not having those role models or actually being violated or you know having an experience in your sexual development that would actually cause you to or cause the enemy to sow seeds of sexual dysfunction and even with all of that the bottom line is to engage in a homosexual relationship ultimately ends up being a choice. Whatever your environment might be, environment may be, to actually become a homosexual, not just wrestle with same-sex attraction, but to actually make the decision to become a homosexual is a choice. It was a, it was a choice for me to be promiscuous. No matter how much I was abused, no matter what happened to me, no matter what influenced me, the choice I made to be promiscuous was my own choice. Similarly, it's a choice to lead a homosexual lifestyle. But God can absolutely turn that around because he turned it around for me when I was fornicating, when I was messing around and occasionally messing around with girls. He changed me and he can change anyone that might be wrestling. So there is grace and there is mercy available. But this is why God doesn't say, yes, have a homosexual relationship because his ways, his kingdom principles cannot actually flourish with homosexuality and cannot flourish when it comes to the transgender ideology. So now, I super quick want to just um, go into pornography and masturbation and then we can finish. So the thing with porn is that it takes our thirst for intimacy, our actual wiring, the way that we were created as intimate beings, and it takes that thirst for intimacy and actually makes intimacy into a commodity. So you end up buying and selling intimacy. And actually, in Song of Solomon, there's this beautiful scripture that says, if I can find it, I probably won't find it in time, but it says that love cannot be bought, that you can't buy love. You can't sell and buy love in the marketplace. It says that in Song of Solomon. So you can't actually, you can't sell or buy love not true love. And it takes, you know, image bearers. It takes human beings that are actually image bearers that Jesus died and gave his life for. He takes people that Jesus shed his blood for and he makes them into like products to be consumed. And porn is actually a, a complete assault on the one flesh Union, because again, like I explained before, that you end up, when you engage in porn and you masturbate, you actually end up becoming one flesh with a virtual image. And you end up having counterfeit attachments in your neurology and in your soul with images, with a fantasy. And that actually becomes, ends up becoming the mental pathway that you associate with sexual pleasure. So you not, no longer are able to actually have sex with your spouse the way that it was ordained because you've actually got used to having mechanical sex or you've got used to having lots of variety and there is this misconception that you can actually be fulfilled with porn because there's so much variety but what ends up starting off as oh yeah click 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 oh I'll look at that I'll look at that oh I don't want to look at that anymore I'm going to look at that click 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 
you end up, like I said earlier on, having all this anticipation, all this variety. Oh, I can do that and I can do that. Or if I click on that, then maybe that will happen and maybe that will happen and maybe that will happen. And that part of your brain that anticipates is literally in overdrive right now. And that part of your pleasure system where dopamine is released is literally being exploded at such unhealthy levels that is eating away at your brain. And so what happens is you get so accustomed and addicted to like this rush, oh, I'm gonna look for this and I'm gonna anticipate that and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. But actually you are never satisfied because the orgasm, the orgasm lasts, you know, such a short amount of time and then it just fizzles out and then you're filled with guilt and then you're filled with shame. And that touch that you need from chemicals such as oxytocin, chemicals, feel good endorphins, what what you can only actually have from a human being that God ordained for you to enjoy, you know, in that sexual union, you are starving yourself of that. And so when you even have the opportunity, opportunity to have sex with your spouse, it doesn't satisfy you anymore because you've got so accustomed to the mechanical approach and you've got so accustomed to like just anticipating, anticipating, anticipating that you have actually lost sense of what true romance looks like. And this is detrimental if you are a young child and your first engagement with sex is through porn, because what you will end up doing is you'll end up growing up thinking that the way two people get together is in that mechanical, like, often seedy, you know, super glamorous, but unrealistic method that you saw on a, you know, in a porn film. And if that becomes your blueprint for how you engage in sex and you get used to masturbation at the age of like 10, then the enemy is able to deny you and hijack your capacity to actually enjoy intimacy with your spouse later on in life. And what ends up happening with porn or with masturbation, when you open those doors, you end up totally violating your sex drive. Like I said yesterday, the sex drive has been created so that it can be mastered and, and you can enjoy it. Like there is no reason why you can't enjoy having a sex drive, even though you're not having sex, but you're walking in holiness, you're walking in purity, you're anticipating what's to come in marriage, but you're enjoying your sexuality you can still enjoy your sex drive without having to succumb to lust, without having to succumb to anything illicit because you can enjoy being a male, you can enjoy being a female, you can enjoy being a sexual being without having to enter into sin. And this is how God wants us to navigate through our sex drives. He doesn't want us to get engaged in porn or masturbation and end up like opening the door to a sex drive that actually is uncontainable because what will then happen is when you do get married, your sex drive will already be completely violated and you won't be able to enjoy it in marriage because you've got used to just having sex in that mechanical way where you are just consuming that image as if it was a product. Even though that's an image bearer of Christ, you just see it as a sex object. And what will end up happening is you won't be able to actually relate to the opposite sex or relate to whoever you know, you're know you with. You won't be able to relate to them as human anymore because you are driven by lust and all you see is them as a sexual object even if you want to, even if you're in a marriage where actually you want to beautify your spouse and you want to honour them and you want to speak words of life to them and you want to encourage them and affirm them, but because your sexual appetite is now completely spent on a virtual image, you have got nothing left to give your spouse because you've given yourself away to a virtual image. Yes. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, that, yes, definitely. So um, there are people that say that actually they're not addicted and say that they can stop at any time. And so really it's not an issue for them. Um, 
yeah, occasional, um, which some people will say that. And actually, there is nothing in the Bible that says masturbation is a sin. But there are, if you actually use the general narrative of the Bible and you take other things in the Bible, which is clearly yes or clearly no, and you use um, what you understand, you know, between righteousness and holiness and all of those things, then you could look at something like masturbation and you could come to the conclusion that the scripture, um, Ben, can you put up the scripture that says everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial, please? So there is a scripture in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 that says everything is beneficial, but not every, sorry, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You could see something like masturbation, and because there's not anything clearly in the Bible that says do not masturbate, but if you look at the fact that it will lead you to fantasizing, and it might not necessarily, like your friend might not be addicted to it, like they may not be operating in lust, but anything that opens the door to fantasy, could later on prevent you from enjoying sexual pleasure with your spouse because you have now, in your mind, got seeds of what fantasy looks like. So when you enjoy the real thing, you are able to fully enjoy the romance of the real thing because fantasy is beginning to give you a picture of what you think romance looks like. And they may not necessarily know that it's actually impacting the way that they see intimacy. They might think that, yes, I could leave it at any time. But in the case of masturbation, um, I will come to you, babes, because I saw you had... Porn or masturbation, whatever it might be, um, you can be under the illusion that it is not impacting you. But it will... One of the reasons is there's something called mirror neurons. So we've, we've all got mirror neurons that, we, that help us to mirror an action that we see in our mind so that we can then copy that action. And when you're watching porn, what happens with the mirror neurons is you're watching porn and your brain is actually imitating what you are seeing on that pornographic film and your brain is learning how to do it so it can then repeat the action because that's how we're wired. We're wired with mirror neurons where what we watch, we can learn how to do it by mirroring that action. And so you could be watching porn and not even realise that you are subconsciously mirroring that action. You're mirroring what is often aggressive behaviour, which is often dominating behaviour in porn and you are storing it so that when you are sexually active, you are more likely to be more aggressive, you are more likely to mirror the stuff that you saw. So engaging in porn isn't necessarily um, just bad because you do it frequently. It's the impact that it has on your capacity to be intimate in the place that God ordained for you to be intimate. Does that make sense? Yeah? Based what you You've kind of already answered it, but what about um, you know, couples who... Do it together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I had a friend who um, said to me that um, she was so used to masturbating before she got married that now when they both are together, she is, she's, she only likes to do it the way that she's used to masturbating. So she still masturbates even though they're married. And I think because of the nature of masturbation, um, when, when I talk about marital sex, I am going to talk about this stuff. Yeah. It's between a couple, really, to make that decision. So even porn between couples. Yeah, but it's, it's up to a couple to make that decision. Because when you are having sex with your spouse, you should be exclusively, you know, the object of one another's affection. And so things like sex toys, things like porn, things that could actually take your attention and affection away from one another, again, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Does it really benefit you? Does watching porn now and again really benefit you? You know, like, sure, you can do what you want. As a married couple, do what you want. You're free to do what you want. But will you get caught up in a mechanic? Because the thing with masturbation is you, you get caught up in this urgency where you're you're just like, oh, you know, and romance goes out of the window, you know, like there's no romance avoid, uh, involved because it can be quite mechanical and you're after this like high. And if you invite that into your married bed, then what happens to romance? 
What happens to actually, you know, that evolving pleasure where you're trying to satisfy each other? Maybe you do it occasionally, but to make a practice of it, I think you will end up violating that exclusive intimacy that you have to um, go on a journey together and explore one another together I'm sure you could masturbate now and again, but I would personally say masturbation is something that has the propensity to begin to drive things and has the propensity to actually become the focus and will strip you away from you two enjoying each other completely. I also want to say, because the Bible doesn't actually say it's wrong, and what about in cases of where people are sick? What about, you know, where spouses are separated? Is there a time when masturbation's okay? Maybe. Like, I don't know. You know, it's between a couple. What if someone hasn't had sex with their spouse for a year because their spouse has had a low sex drive? Is masturbation okay? Maybe. Like, it's not a clear thing, but in general, Anything that causes you to fantasize, anything that takes you into a world of, you know, imagination, I think cannot be good for you. And anything that leads to a mechanical approach, excuse me, cannot be good for you. But is it better than going out and paying a prostitute? Maybe. Is it better than, you know, succumbing to something else like fornication? Uh, masturbation might be the better choice. I don't know. But in general, I would say if you can avoid it in your life and if you can avoid it in your marital bed, I would suggest that you do. But ultimately, it's between you and your spouse. I believe that masturbation is not acceptable. Yeah. Because there's so many ways to um, be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But you, you might have someone, like you might have someone who's really wrestling with um, fornication and doesn't, you know, doesn't, you know, want to go out and have sex with someone and they might find themselves wrestling, you know, they might feel, okay, rather than me going out and having sex with X, Y, and Z, I'm going to masturbate. And I'm not saying that's okay, but I also feel that, you know, it's, it is a little bit of a grey area, and there is mercy. You know, I don't, I don't encourage masturbation as a practice, but what if someone's addicted to it right now? You know, what's going to happen? What if they love the Lord, but they're addicted to masturbation? Yes, it may be their heart's desire to not do it anymore. Like, they, it might be killing them. It might be filling them with guilt and shame, but... The Lord's not going to reject them, you know, like, yes, it's not beneficial. Yes, it's not helpful to them. But what if that's the one thing that they actually can't stop doing right now? So I'm not condoning it. I believe that it will lead to more doors. I believe that it will so open the door to the demonic. But is it a definite no? No. Is it something that the Bible specifically says don't do it? No. But in my experience and what I've seen and what I've read and what I know of the Bible, I wouldn't tamper with it, you know. And I sure as heck would not allow um, children, you know, like I would not promote it as just having fun or experimenting. Like at the moment in my nation, they are introducing masturbation into schools from next year. Four-year-olds are going to be told how to masturbate. And that is... Because um, it's part of this agenda, mm -hmm. part of this agenda, yeah, where this agenda of sexual immorality is being completely, um, I just keep spitting, completely advanced into our schools, yeah, everywhere. And this is why I want to teach this stuff, because we have to rise up. And it's being done without parents' permission. So unless we as Christians rise up and choose to be a voice and get clued up on this topic, if we don't do that, then four-year-olds will start masturbating. And, wow. you know, it will, be, it will be the only sex they will ever know because they would have been taught it in their, in their formative years. And we have to have enough wisdom and knowledge and conviction and boldness to say, don't settle for that crap. 
because what God has for you is worth waiting for. And what, it, what he has for you is so worthy and so valuable and so worth cheriting and cherishing and so worth celebrating that reject every single counterfeit that you are ever faced with. This is why as the body of Christ, we have to rise up and we have to understand God's blueprint for sexuality because our children are being faced with counterf- counterfeit sexuality and actually their sexuality is being destroyed from childhood because of our lack as the body of Christ to actually be a voice but that is all changing so that's exciting stuff praise Jesus um so yeah basically um the one last thing that I want to say is someone could watch porn and you know they could have problems at home like they could think that, oh, my wife often rejects me or, you know, she's not around or X, Y, and Z. There's lots, so many reasons someone could engage in, engage in porn. So many reasons how people might end up being involved in masturbation. Like it's not for us to judge. Like God have mercy on all of us living in this sexually broken world. Um, but if you've got someone who is thinking that porn or masturbation is a great way to engage in sex because there's lots of variety and, you know, is without the headache and the nagging of your spouse or your partner you know making you feel like crap like it doesn't have all of that stuff it's just easy but that's such a lie because actually what it ends up doing is ends up hijacking your capacity to truly be intimate and oftentimes because of our home situations because of what happens in marriage because of brokenness people aren't enjoying sexuality the way that God created But really, the way that God created sexuality in marriage is that it's always evolving, is that foreplay isn't just something you do just before you have sex, but it's this whole lifestyle of foreplay. You know, we're using one another's love language to really woo each other and flirt with one another and exchanging all these glorious gestures. And it's all, you know, kind of wrapped up in this glorious covenant intimacy that's built on love and unconditional value and compassion and and trust for one another. And within that context of marital intimacy, you are always evolving in the way that you're enjoying sexual intimacy. And yes, it takes work. Of course it takes work. Anything that's worth fighting for takes work. But there is a lie that says that porn can compare to that kind of intimacy. But sometimes that's all people have because they're not getting marital sex at home or they're not getting any kind of intimacy at home and there's brokenness at home. So refraining from porn as a married couple is just, that's just half the battle. Just refraining from dysfunctional sex, refraining from masturbation is just half the battle. You have to be having good sex in your marital bed. That's what you need to be having because just not having bad sex is just half of the issue. Having good sex, godly sex, sex that's varied, sex that's full of God, sex that's free and affirming and fun and liberating and, you know, where you're able to really just be yourself and feel valued and feel desirable and feel connected. That's the kind of sex that God has ordained for marriage and that's what he wants. And something like porn and masturbation will hijack all of that and shortchange you where you never get to enjoy that, either in your marriage now or in your future. But that's not to say that if you're not married or if you don't ever get married, it's not to say that you will be incomplete. Because when you're a sexual being in Christ and you have true intimacy with him, whether you're having sex, whether you're married or not, you are already fully whole. And you have the capacity to enjoy bliss and glory with Jesus that trumps any kind of earthly bliss. So if marriage, you know, or future marriage isn't part of the plan, it doesn't matter. You've already hit the jackpot with Jesus. Yes. Um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking that. Um, I'll repeat the question. Um, you know, when the men or the woman get cut, because, um, you know, like you said, they will have mercy, okay? We don't know this right motivation or porno. And it's said to go. Uh, por- pornography is definitely wrong. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, um, in the beginning, it says that uh, we are the temple of God, that we have to respect ourselves. Yeah, okay? absolutely, so yeah. Something else that maybe we need to. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. When the person has a relationship with the Lord, yeah. intimate relationship with the Lord, yeah. okay, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. So there's so many other ways that we can be able to work. Totally, with yes. Yeah, but absolutely. Everything is about intimacy, relationship with the Lord. Yeah. We know our body. We know yes. how to, you know, so yeah. we, know how, we know how to offend heaven. Yeah. We know 
how to not offend yeah. parents. So yeah. it's about choices. Yeah, but I, I, I agree with that totally, but I also want to have compassion for people in their broken places because all of that is correct, but what do we do during process? What do we do when someone is wrestling with a sick spouse? What do we do when someone um, is wrestling with sexual desire? Although masturbation, I believe, is wrong, but... I don't want to condemn someone who may have resorted to masturbation because they don't see any other option at that time. And so I do believe that based on the Bible, that masturbation is something that none of us should engage in. But I believe that for some people, sometimes, occasionally, masturbation might be what they resort to, not because they're trying to sin, but because they don't know any other way. And I believe God's mercy is sufficient and that he sees the heart of a person. And that's the same with anything, really. physical struggles that couldn't function. Yeah. And the uh, lady, uh, instead of cheating, he wants to respect that, that he was in treatment, so he was using masturbation to release her. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the way they, yeah. they work together. And the thing is, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's like, it's not ideal, because we want to all be sexually whole. None of us wants to resort to anything. But what do we do when we're, when we're in the middle of that broken place and actually something like masturbation could be what you feel is your godly offering before the Lord rather than sinning, you know? Yeah, so I, I, I just don't want to judge someone's situation ever. Um, but things like masturbation, I think, can't be beneficial. You know, they might end up being the exit strategy in a particular situation. They might end up being like the crutch that you hold on to for that time. But as a practice, I would say flee lust, flee anything like that. Right, guys, we've literally just got a really short window of time for prayer. Um, and was it Lynn? Yeah, Lynn, if you would like to come to the front. Diana, if, if anyone that is part of the wonderful prayer team um, that we're so, so thankful to have... Um, so we're so blessed to actually have, um, you know, people that are actually part of a prayer ministry. And Lynn actually, like, does sozos, you know, so deep um, healing and salvation and just deep deliverance, you know, just where, where you, you would have sozo carried out. So she really does know what she's praying about. Um, and can I just, Deanne and... Martin. Marta, Marta. So we're here to pray for you. I'm also here to pray for you. So if there's anything that you would like to get prayer for, um, and I've been really open and honest with you guys, you know, because I want to break shame. And so I would really appeal to you anything that is holding you captive, anything in your life that is actually stealing who you were really created to be, anything that's enslaving you, anything that's hurting you in regards to the things that we talked about today, come and get set free. Come and get set free. Like when I was in worship here last week, as I was, I was literally standing there and I was in worship and I felt the Lord say that he was coming here in this session to break chains. This session specifically, I felt him say, I am coming to set people free. So don't leave this session unfree. So please come and get prayer. If, um, if we need more space, we can get more space. And then, um, Diane, I don't know if you want to say something about lunch, because lunch is going to be from one to two. So obviously, we'll open up the altar for prayer. But um, feel free to, you know, leave at one or even earlier. But please do come back at two.